Titus chapter 3, starting at verse 1. It says, Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. Let us pray. Our great Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for allowing us to be here tonight. Father, we pray that you be with us and bless us and that your spirit might move throughout this sanctuary. Touch the hearts and lives of each and every one of us. Father, we thank you so much for your word that you've given us. We pray that you'd help us to take your word and apply it to our lives and be better people to be you because of it. In Jesus' name I pray. Y'all know what a teenager is. I got a list of things here that a teenager is. It's a teenager is a person who can't remember to walk the dog, but he never forgets the phone number. A teenager is a weight watcher who goes on a diet by giving up candy bars before breakfast. <laughs> a youngster who receives his or her allowance on Monday, spends it on Tuesday, and borrows from her, his or her best friend on Monday. Someone who can hear a song by Lady Gaga played three blocks away but not hear to her mother calling from the next room. A whiz who can operate the latest computer or iPhone without a lesson but they can't figure out how to make their bed. A youngster who is well informed about anything he doesn't have to study. A teenager is a connoisseur of two kinds of music, loud and very loud. A person who's always late for dinner but always on time for a rock concert. And this is my favorite one. A teenager is a boy who can sleep until noon on any Saturday when he suspects the grass is mowed. <laughs> now, some of you may be asking why we define a teenager. What are we talking about here? Well, we're defining them because we've all been around them. Most of us, a lot of us have tried to raise them or pray for somebody else who's trying to raise them. And to raise them, they have to be continually reminded about life and things to do. They have to be reminded of, to clean their rooms and to take out the trash and to do the dishes and to, and to pick up their dirty clothes and do their homework. And we have to remind them to be careful while they're driving. Reminding is kind of part of life. It's, it's the boss of job to remind their employees to do their work. And it's the responsibility of a pastor to remind his people of what the scriptures and, 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 and their Christian responsibilities in this world are. That's why Paul said in 2 Timothy 4 2, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Now I believe in preaching, but I've discovered that I still need to refresh my memory a lot over and over again in order to do a, a halfway decent job of preaching. I heard about a man one time, a preacher who who said he could prepare his sermon and be through with his Sunday morning sermon on Thursday, lay it on his desk, and put it down and not look at it again until he got behind the pulpit Sunday morning. Well, all I can say about that is his memory must be a whole lot better in mind. Because I go over that thing all week long and at least twice on Sunday morning before I ever get behind the pulpit. And do the same thing on Sunday night. The reason I do that is I have to remind me so that I can remind you. Paul tells Titus what he ought to remind the people. He gives us three things to remind the people of. He said, remind them to be in subjection, remind them to do good work, and remind them to be humble. In Titus 3, the first part of verse 1, it says, put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers to obey magistrates. Y'all remember that movie, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid? Come out in about 69, that was a little before my time, but I've seen it, I still kind of like the movie. Played by oh, Paul Newman was Butch Cassidy and Robert Redford was a Sundance kid. Well, that was kind of Hollywood's take on it. I want to tell you this tonight about the real Butch Cassidy. <coughs> Butch Cassidy is wild boy from the last of the outlaw gangs in the West. His real name was Robert Leroy Barker. And his daddy was a very devout Mormon who uh, owned a ranch in Utah. Uh, unfortunately, though, young Butch or Robert, or whatever you want to call him, he kind of had a fellow he looked up to a lot that worked on one of his daddy's ranch hands. The man's name was uh, Mike Cassidy. And when Mike was killed in a gunfight, John Parker took the name of Butch Cassidy. It didn't take him long before he was learning the trade as a member of the, of the Tom McCarty gang. As a train driver, uh, uh, Robert, Butch relied on trickery instead of gunfight. A lot of times what he would do is he would Actually, him and, and several of his gang members would buy a ticket and get on the train. And they'd ride the train to a certain local part of the, of, of the, of the trail. Or, and he would have other gang members that would flag down the train. He would stop them and say that there was a loose iron or a rock slide or something was blocking the track up ahead. 
And while they had the train stopped, the ones that had already bought the ticket and were on the train were surprised the guards. They would take them over, take the safe, take it outside, put a stick of dynamite in, blow it up, and be gone in a matter of minutes. By 1901, dozens of railroad detectives and lawmen were hunting Butch Cassidy's wildfire. We decided it's time for him to clear out. He fled to South America with the Sundance Kid and, and the Sundance Kid's uh, girlfriend was Etta Blake. There it was said that they robbed banks and mines in Peru and Chile and Bolivia until 1911 where they were handled and killed, I believe, and sold. See, Butch Cassidy was a rebel. He rebelled against man and he rebelled against God. But the truth of the matter is, it's all true. Romans 3 23 says, For all of sin and come short of the glory of God. See, some people are, are worse in their rebellion than others, but we've all rebelled. We've all done things that, that we shouldn't have done. I used to work at a place called Avon's Dairy, and, I, and when I worked at Avon's Dairy, there I, I, I saw a lot of things that, that kind of bothered me. I worked at night, and uh, the night crew, we didn't really have a set schedule. We, we didn't have a certain amount of hours. We worked till we got done. Some nights you might work six hours, some nights you might work ten. So, and all the supervisors had pretty much gone home. It was every, up to everybody to do their own work. So uh, around this time of year, people would get to need a little extra Christmas money. And a lot of times, they could be through with the job in six hours. But they'd sit around and goof off and make them a little overtime and make the job last a little longer. We all, I want you to know that's rebellion. It's rebellion against the authority that says that you're supposed to work for every hour that you're getting paid for. But it's not just at work. It's everywhere, every aspect of society that we see rebellion. It's at home, it's at school, it's in the military, it's in politics, and it's in church. The rebellion against certain authorities is going to get a person in trouble pretty quick. See, there's three authorities that I don't want to rebel against. I don't want to rebel against the law. I don't want to rebel against the military. And I certainly don't want to rebel against the law of God. You see, the idea of the scripture here is that we're supposed to be in subjection to all authorities. Why? Because God says it's the right thing to do. See, the Christian is supposed to be the most obedient, faithful worker instead of Romans 13, 1 through 3 says that every soul be subject unto the higher power. For there is no power but of God. The powers that be ordained are of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. Luke 6, 46, Jesus said, and why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? We are to be subject to the power of God. The next thing we're supposed to do, or that Paul told Titus to do, is to remind them to do good work. Verse 3, I'm mean, chapter 3, verse 1 again says, Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work. To be ready to every good work. That's what we're supposed to do for, for everyone and towards everyone. Unfortunately, though, we live in a country where we're getting and having more just seems so normal to us today. See, because of that, people who choose to live with, with less so that they can help other people, to put it mildly, it seems kind of absurd to some people. I'm thankful that a man named Zell Kravinsky was one of these people that did not seem a little absurd. Kravinsky got rich in the real estate business. And then he gave away nearly every bit of his fortune to charity. Y'all, this man gave away $45 million to charity. He said a lot of people seem to feel I'm crazy. But personally, I think he's a He realizes that we're not put here on this earth. On this earth. We're not put here in this world for our pleasure. We're not given blessings for our pleasure. God blesses us so that we can be a blessing to other people. I think the bench has got it. There's another one. Her name Karen Pillman. She also gave away a fortune to help other people. She created the Chihara Foundation to help low-income women and girls. And she did this with her $3 million trust fund. At first, she said it was difficult for a family to understand the decision. She said it was hard for them because they put that money aside for not security. They did it out of love, and so I think it was hard for them to understand why I wouldn't want it. But then she gave the explanation as a woman. And it was amazingly simple. She said this on 2020. I didn't need that. She just didn't need that. Y'all, so because she didn't need that much, she was willing to help someone else 
when she could. She went on to say, I would never judge or say how much any one person needs. But I knew for myself in my life that I didn't need this $3 million. So she gave money to the groups that help low-income workers and the disenfranchised, particularly women. A man named Richard Simmons kind of felt the same way Fiddleman did. Said that he doesn't need a whole lot to live with. See, for three decades, Simler has been giving over half of his income to charity. The total gift giving, he said, is at about seven hundred and seventy thousand, and it may be close to eight hundred thousand by the end of this year. His goal is to give away before he dies one million dollars. Now, understand what Simler does for a living. He's a college professor who teaches algebra and calculus. Because of that, y'all, y'all can bet he's done the math. He knows what it's costing him to give away this much money. He went on to say, there are a few personal sacrifices. It means a fairly small apartment. I'm driving a fairly old car. That's a choice I've made. The choice not to have a large house. The choice not to have a pool. The choice not to have a boat on the Atomic River. The choice not to have a new car every two or three years. This way I can use 55 to 60% of my income to support the charity. as well as the So we can Central Union Mission. And uh, he has a house for Habitat for Humanity. Y'all, I don't know about y'all, but I don't have three million dollars. I don't, certainly don't have forty-five million dollars worth of goods. I don't even have a million dollars. But that's not the point. The point is that we all need to do all the good we can to help other people. We need to use what God has given us, the blessings that He's given us, so that we can be a blessing to somebody else. And that includes giving some money to us. Galatians six nine and ten says, "And let us not be weary in well doing." For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Y'all, we need to do whatever is good in the sight of God and the sight of others. We need to do all the good we can for everybody. And there's a reason for this. The reason is that we are servants of Jesus Christ. And that's what Jesus did. When someone asked Jesus for help, he didn't say, well, let me make sure you meet these criteria first. Let me go through my checklist to make sure that you meet all the qualifications. If he encountered somebody that needed his help, he helped him. Period. I've told some of y'all before, and I'm going to tell all of you now. There was a time in my life where I just flat out didn't like church folks. I loved the Lord. I always loved the Lord with all my heart. But I didn't like church folks. The reason being is I've seen too many times people that needed help. Over and over and over again, I've seen it. This ain't just a one time thing. People that needed help. And they'd go to the church, and the church would look down their holier than thou noses and decide they weren't good enough to receive their help. So, do y'all know where a lot of these people got their help from? They got their help from the old alcoholics and the, and the people that the church would look at as less desired. That's where they got their help from. Y'all, churches are slipping. And I'm not just talking about Calvary. I mean, churches all over the world are slipping and we're not doing our job. It's not our job to hold everybody in judgment. It's not our job to look down holier than our noses and judge the other, other people. It's our job to be servants of Jesus Christ and to help people in any way that we can. 1 Corinthians 10, 31 says, Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Third thing. The mind to be humble. Titus 3, 2 says, To speak evil of no man, to be no broad, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. 1 Peter 5, 5 says, Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the other. Yea, all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility, for God resisteth the proud, and giveth grace to the humble. To show true humility, be humble towards all. Y'all, we must not slander anybody. Instead, we must be peaceful and considerate. We're not to speak evil of anyone. But Titus 3, 2 again. The very first part of Titus 3, verse 2. To speak evil of no man. Let me say that again because this is a problem that we seem to be having here at Calvary Baptist Church. We are not to speak evil of anybody. If you're sitting right there and you're, you're starting to wonder if you, hmm, I wonder if maybe he's speaking to me. Let me answer that for you. Yes, I'm speaking to you. I'm talking to every single solitary one of you. We are not to speak evil of anyone. It says as plain as day right there in black and white in the Word of God. I'm not saying it. No other, nobody else is saying it. God said it. It's in His Word. We are not to speak evil of anyone. I can't stress it enough. 
Our Vice President, Joe Biden, on June 26, 2010, visited a custom shop in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And he was there to talk about jobs, and he stopped at this place called Cop Frozen Yoga. I think it's a chain. Anyway, while he was in there, he got him some yogurt, and he got ready to leave, and he said, what I owe you? man said, oh, don't worry about it. It's on up. Which is fine. He had a good shut up right there. But then he went on to open the mouth again. He said, lower our taxes and we'll call it easy. A few minutes later, Biden got kind of aggravated by the remark. He said, why don't you just say something nice instead of being smart about it? You know, most of the time, it pays just to keep your mouth shut. Especially when you're tempted to slander someone or say something bad about them. Instead, we're to be considerate and humble towards all. High up in the Andes Mountains, there's pack goats. When these pack goats, pack goats get on a ledge that's too narrow for both of them to pass over, one of them is willing to get down on his knees and let the other one walk over the top of it so that they can both pass safely. Y'all pack goats have got more sense than most critics because we refuse to get down on our knees and let people walk over it so that we can both pass safely. Now, I know that that kind of goes against the grain with us as, as Americans, and we want to stand up for our rights, and I'm not going to let anybody run over me. Well, listen, that's what society says, that's what the world says, but that's not what God said. And we're supposed to be living according to what God said, not according to what the world said. And maybe when somebody purposely does evil towards us, maybe we ought to just kind of let go and let God. Y'all ever heard that expression? In other words, don't try to get vengeance yourself. Let go of it and just let God take care of it. 1 Peter 2, 20 and 21 says, For what glory is it if when ye be buffeted for your faults, ye shall take it patiently? But if when ye do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. For even here too were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow this step. In other words, when you mess up and somebody fusses at you about it, and you just kind of take it on the chin and go on. So what? You messed up to start with. You shouldn't have done it. But when you do right, and then people criticize you, and they ridicule you, and make fun of you, and then you take it on the chin and go on, that's when you glorify God. Because there's times in the Christian life when we have to suffer, even when we're doing what's wrong. Standing up for your rights is not always the right thing to do. I know it's hard to do. I know it's hard not to. That's what God tells us to do. Someone asked Francis and sister, I could accomplish so much in life. I want to read to you what he said. He said, this may be why. The Lord looked down from heaven and said, where can I find the weakest, littlest, lowliest man on earth? Then he saw me and said, I found him. I'll work through him. He won't be proud of it. He'll see that I'm only using him because of his insignificance. God opposes the pride, but he gives grace to the humble. It may be that he uses the humble persons more so in life than anybody else. To be humble towards all men, we first have to be humble before God. Also, remind the people. We all need to be reminded of things to do. Most important, we need to be reminded to care for and nurture our relationship with God. We need to be thankful for God to remind us who are part of Hebrews 10, 24 and 25 says, Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approach. Y'all, this is a time more than ever before. We need to be lifting each other up, not fighting and bickering among ourselves and kicking each other one another. We need to lift each other up. Love us. Pray for one another. Grace Heavenly Father, we come to you tonight. Thank you for your love. Father, we're so thankful that you don't act like we do. Father, we're so thankful that you forgive us when we fail. Father, we're so thankful that you don't hold grudges against us. Father, we're so thankful that you love us the way you do. Father, I pray tonight that you would be with us and bless us. Father, I pray that you would help us to love one another the way you would have us to love one another. To forgive one another the way you would have us to forgive one another. Do not hold grudges. Do not backstab and talk bad about one another. But to love each other.
Father, I love you and I thank you for all that you've done and all that you've done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.